Um, good morning and welcome to the 30th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. I've received apologies from Monica Lennon. Um, could I ask everybody in the gallery to switch off their electronic devices or at least switch them to silent mode so they don't interfere with our work? Item one on the agenda um, is a decision on whether to take business in private. Do we agree to take item three in private? Yes. Thank you very much. <coughs> item two is major capital projects. And we're now going to take evidence from the Scottish Government's latest major capital projects update. And I welcome to the committee this morning Peter Rickey, Deputy Chief Executive and Director of Investments, and Kerry Alexander, Investment Programmes Director, um, both from the Scottish Futures Trust. Eleanor Emberson, Director of Financial Strategy, Helen Carter, Infrastructure Investments Team Leader, and Alan Morrison, Capital Accounting and Policy Manager, all from the Scottish Government. And finally, but, but by no means least, Robert McBride, Project Manager, Rail Directorate of Transport Scotland. Um, I understand Eleanor will provide a brief opening statement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for inviting us today to give evidence on the, the latest major capital project update, which we provided in, in October, and which covers the six months ending in September 2017. We are absolutely committed to working with the committee and with Audit Scotland to make sure that the information that we provide is as helpful as possible. The, the current reporting format follows what was agreed by the previous committee and Audit Scotland and Scottish Government. And for the latest report, we have also taken on board um, three suggestions made by the Auditor General to include outline business case information or equivalent, the programme pipeline as well as the major capital projects, <clears throat> and a summary stating how projects are financed. I note that your interest in the very important contribution to the economy uh, that the infrastructure plays, and the report contains information about economic impact, including jobs supported through our investment. In addition, I'm aware that the committee would like to see private sector leverage and net present values of revenue projects captured in the report. We haven't been able to do that for this one due to timing, but we intend to work with Audit Scotland and committee clerks to provide additional information in the next report in a format that you would find helpful. Um, Mike, you've introduced all of the, the colleagues I have uh, with me today. I must just mention we've had a very unfortunate set of circumstances um, with transport colleagues, <clears throat> three senior Transport uh, Scotland colleagues uh, who have broad remits have all, um, for various reasons, been unwell. And uh, Robert has very nobly stepped into the breach. His particular area of interest is rail. But obviously, if you've got questions about other transport projects, we'll do our best. We may, if there, if there are detailed points, have to write to the committee to follow up. Um, I think that's all I need to say. But I think uh, colleagues from Scottish Futures Trust have a couple of declarations of interest they would like to make. Peter Rieke. Thank you very much. Um, I should just let the committee be aware that I act as a director, a public interest director, on Aberdeen Roads Limited, which is the, the company that delivers the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route project, and on one of the legacy non-profit distributing projects, the uh, Take Care Health Limited, which provides services at Murray Royal and at Stracathro Hospitals. Thank you. Thank you, you very Kerry. much. Kerry? I would also like to declare a similar uh, non-financial interest in uh, Galliford Tri Equitix Inverness Limited, which is the um, entity that, that delivers the Inverness College project. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and with that, can I say we perfectly understand when people become unwell. Um, indeed, some of our parliamentary colleagues have been struck down by something similar. So um, it, we, we thank Robert for stepping into the breach. OK, can I turn to members' questions and start with Colin Beattie? Thank you, Convener. Uh, I'd like to touch on rail, so it's good that uh, Robert McBride's here. Um, let me kill one thing quickly, which, uh, which has always been niggling at the back of my mind. HS2. I'm assuming that uh, if HS2 doesn't extend to Scotland, as it certainly doesn't appear to at the moment, that we have no financial commitment to that and would not be putting any money into it. I do not believe so, but that is an area that I would, I'm not comfortable, not a specialist area of mine, but I can't believe that we would be committed to 
funding in that, but I can come back to you specifically on I that. I would like, just to settle that little niggling doubt at the back of my mind, I'd appreciate that. Looking at the rail projects in particular, there are a number of the projects, obviously, that are overrunning in terms of price. How are we dealing with that? How are we coping with these overruns? How are they going to be met? And are they impacting on other projects? They're, they are still affordable. Uh, we, we are working with Network Rail to, to try and improve governance. But since the, the EY report published last year, uh, we have introduced a stronger governance uh, portfolio boards, which Transport Scotland chair. Uh, we continue to press Network Rail for more transparency and stronger reporting. Uh, and we are seeing a, a significant improvement in the, the project controls that they are applying across the piece. So you're saying that uh, the overruns are going to be compensated for in other aspects of the project? In what respect, sorry? Well, you, you, you've spent more on projects than you budgeted for. That money's got to come from somewhere. It's still... You, it's, apologies, when you go. You, you're saying that uh, you've imp improved on the management, controls and all the rest of it. Does that mean that you're going to be able to compensate somewhere else in the budget for these overruns that have taken place already, or are they having to be absorbed elsewhere? They'll be absorbed within what is classed as the headroom, uh, which is the, the financial settlement for control period five. So it won't impact on other projects? It shouldn't do. Hmm. Okay. Um, talking about... Uh, the overruns. Why did they come around? Why weren't the why weren't the controls in place already? Why did why why do we have to be in a position where a budget significantly overruns? And you know we're talking about the Edinburgh Glasgow rail improvements. We're talking about Sealing Dunblane and Alloa rail electrification. Why weren't they picked up earlier? Why wasn't that to put under some sort of special control? I think you've touched on two specific projects there uh, on Edinburgh Glasgow. I think that there, there have been significant lessons learned on the electrification of the ENG. Uh, I think there's widely accepted issues that have come across around the governance and controls. Uh, I think the procurement model has been proven not to be successful uh, in the alliance. For railways for a long time now, why the, suddenly do we find that the procurement process is not up to scratch? The, the model that was used, the, the, the alliance model that, that Network Rail entered into with the two contractors, was effectively a, a, a novel procurement model for railway in Scotland. So was this a new procurement model that was brought in? Which certainly failed? Within, certainly within Scotland, for real, yes. Who decided to bring that in? Network Rail. Network Rail? Yeah. So they brought in a, in a procurement process that failed and is costing money? I think that that's a component part of what the root cause is. I think it's, it's evident elsewhere, electrification schemes. Mm are experiencing cost increases across the UK. And does that come back to procurement? Uh, I'm not qualified to say about what the, the, the detail is on other schemes, but I think it's, it's a contributing qualified, factor. Who is qualified to say? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there are people within rail that have a, a, a greater in, interest and greater knowledge across the UK network that could feedback. My concern is, the bottom line is, Network Rail, from what you're saying, Network Rail brought in a procurement process that failed and was at least contributed towards cost overruns, is that, is, is, is that factual? Uh, uh, it's certainly a contributing factual. factor, yes. What comeback do we have on Network Rail? Uh, they're now a public classified body, so I, I think that the comeback that we had previously through the, the regulatory environment is, has changed significantly. But what has been done with Network Rail? You're saying that they've changed the procurement process, is that right, as a result of this experience? The, for for Stirling Dunblane Alloa, the, the model was actually meant to be rolled out again, and they have actually moved away from that. They're actually entering into tra traditional contracts. But they've still got overrun? On SDA, there, there will be, yes. So it's not entirely the procurement process that's the issue? It, it's electrification schemes in general, yes. So it is the procurement process? That's electrification schemes. So blanket, the yeah, electrification uh, process, it's, it's the procurement process for the electrification is, a, is, a, is, a, is at least a contributory factor to the overrun, overall? 
not just it's a more the delivery contract. of electrification rather than the procurement process. Electrification schemes throughout the UK have all experienced cost overruns. It's a significant. Why? Uh, I can Is it so novel? It's not. Absolutely not. Well, perhaps you might consult with people that do have yeah, that information absolutely. and come back to us. Sorry, can I'm sort of. But uh, and and give us that information as to why these electrification process uh, programs across the UK and specifically in Scotland are overrunning. I mean, you have given some information here, but it's not. You've okay. brought in new information now about the procurement process and so on, and I think uh, it'd be good to pursue that. Just briefly to move away from from the railways. Um, what about the city deals or city region deals that are coming up? Obviously, the Scottish Government is going to be putting money into that. Are these going to be coming forward in this report as well? Uh, I, I mean, we, we would report on city deals. Um, I mean, obviously, they're a, a significant investment, so there's a, uh, a, a lot of money both locally and nationally going into city deals. Um, I don't think we have traditionally reported on them through this mechanism because we, we report in a variety of ways, but if it's important to the committee, we can ensure you get information. Premier, I would suggest that also. since it is a significant investment that's going in of public funds and we have a responsibility to follow the public pound, perhaps we should see the information on that. There's no problem with providing information. I, it's merely where and how you want it. Well, I think... Perhaps the starting point is what information is available and in what format, and perhaps we can then review that. Very happy to, as, as I said at the beginning, very happy to work with Audit Scotland and with committee clerks around what's the best way of getting the right information to this committee on anything that's of interest. I think there's certainly an interest in, in the major capital projects, but, but some of these might be led by the local authority rather than ourselves. So we'll, we'll look at a way of finding um, a suitable way of reporting. OK, I know Bill Bowman wanted to come in, and so did Liam Kerr. So, Bill? Thank you. Just a, a quick question to Eleanor Emerson. Mr McBride mentioned overruns being met out of headroom, what I would call cushion or contingency. I mean, how much money do you have available to cover overruns? So, um, Mr McBride was referring to this, the very specific um, arrangements within rail funding. Um, he did refer to control period five. The, there is there is a UK wide set of financing arrangements around rail, where Scottish government contributes and the UK government contributes. So the any anything that we're doing would not be coming out of general Scottish government funds. There is a, there's a very specific set of rail financing arrangements. Um, I'm afraid I don't have in front of me the full financial breakdown of that. But in following up, we've we've undertaken already to follow up. Uh, on Mr Beattie's questions, we can obviously provide some information about that if it's important to the committee. I think it would be interesting, since you've raised this ability to fund it, there's obviously some money there that may or may not be used. And maybe in doing that, you can tell us how you deal with, with that yourself more generally. Deal with rail funding? No, just generally, generally overruns. Um, OK, yes. If you can't do it now. I mean, overruns on other things other than rail, sorry. I just well, I just that. generally, you know, having raised the topic of um, headroom um, and overruns, yes. you know, does that, that doesn't apply anywhere else? Of course it does. Um, this so you is have something in your pocket available. <laughs> the, the, the capital programme, as you know, is um, very substantial. So the direct funding of, the direct capital funding from Scottish Government is um, well over three billion per year. There's all the other revenue funding arrangements, uh, we are juggling that programme, we're managing it. So all projects uh, have to manage, as you know, time, cost, quality. You would hope at the start of any project that we've done our, um, that the, the analysis has been done really well, the planning, we've built in appropriate contingency and headroom. doesn't always turn out that way. Sometimes we get money released back from projects, sometimes projects need additional funding. We manage that across the piece. We don't generally do it by, by putting a bit of money aside and not spending. We do it by active management of the projects that are underway. So you have some form of reporting on that? I th think that you would see the, 
the, the reporting of changes in costs on projects that in the but information in total, we provide. To but, see how your juggling is doing. Uh, well, you'll see how project costs have changed up and down over the period. So I think that that is yeah, us. Individual project. Yes. But then when you've got to add them all up to see if you're in balance or out of balance. Well, we have to be in balance. We don't we don't have the we, we have a capital borrowing power. But within the limits of that, we don't have um, any any room to to spend more than is available in a given year. So we have to balance. It comes back to Colin Beatty's point. I don't want to put word in his mouth, but. If one goes over, what suffers then? How do you, how do you deal with that? Um, well, generally speaking, things don't suffer because, as I say, some projects go up, some projects go down. You manage the profile of projects over years. This is a very large programme of work. Um, and the, the, the amounts of money that we're talking about going up and down are a small part of it, not, not the bulk of it. Um, OK, leave it there Liam for a moment. Kent. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to stick on rail, uh, if you don't mind. Um, Colin Beatty brought in High Speed 2, HS2. Um, at page 71, we've got a report uh, about options to bring high speed rail in general to Scotland. Uh, and it talks about options have been completed for CP6 or 7, which, just to confirm, I think is uh, up to about 2030. Would that be right? CP6. CP6. CP6 is 2019 to 2024. And so 7 will be 24 to 30, is that right? 24 to 29. To 29, OK. Um, it, the update tells us that there's uh, the options have been presented in October. Are you just able to give us an update on where we are on that? I would ask my colleagues, one of my colleagues from Transport Scotland to write to you on that. He was actually hoping to be here today, uh, but he's dealing specifically with that. I understand. Okay, thank you. Uh, so moving on then, just staying in the same section, uh, Mr McBride, if you would, uh, the, there's reference to the Aberdeen to Central Belt rail improvements. Uh, now, so I stay in Aberdeen and I remember the city deal being announced and at the time uh, there was quite a big fanfare made about duelling the track at Yusan. Uh, and funding had apparently been made available for that. Now, I've asked quite a few questions of various parties since, uh, because this seems to have been kicked into the long grass, uh, which is situated in a place called It Will Never Happen. Uh, so uh, I'm just concerned, because in the update, uh, there is reference to... Uh, for the, So this is page 73, separate development works, so 200 million Aberdeen to Yusan Montrose project. Now that rather suggests to me that whatever improvements are made will stop prior to Yusan. Are you able to comment on this at all? I'm not, unfortunately. Apologies. <laughs> and after I set up the question <laughs> at such length... <laughs> so apologies for the waste of breath. We, we, we shall come back on that. Uh, I'd, I'd be very grateful uh, because genuinely I'm struggling to get some clarity on that. Uh, perhaps you may not be able to ask uh, answer then as part of the wider project uh, of the Aberdeen to Central Belt, there's obviously this uh, drive to reduce the journey time by 20 minutes. Uh, and the reference group has now been set up, I understand, met for the second time in October. Uh, so first of all, what progress was there in October? And secondly, I see there's two references to Network Rail not meeting the STPR objective of 20 minutes. Are you able to give us more detail on that, please? I'm not, unfortunately. Well, can, I, can I just clarify, when, I, when Ella touched at the, the start, I am working specifically at the moment on Egypt and Stirlingdon Blaine Avila. Uh, so if there's anything out with that, uh, if there's anything in the briefing, etc., that I can cover off, I certainly will. But unfortunately, I'll, I'll come back and commit to responding and writing, if that's OK. OK. Uh, perhaps, convener, if we might have full details on the... Uh Absolutely. I think, I think you set up the questions very well, and I'm sure whoever's responsible will come back in writing to us. Uh, Can I just clarify, is that just a general progress update on where things are and what was kind of came out of the October meeting? Yes, and, and specifically uh, that use on junction yep. uh, business or the duelling would be very useful. 
Um, the you. clerks will be in touch if we are looking for further information to specify exactly what we're after. Okay. I'll come back later. Okay. Can I move on to Alex Neil? Please, thank you, <coughs> you convener. Can I first of all refer to um, Table 15 at the end of Appendix A in the the projects list? Um, my view is that we can't really get a proper view of the capital programme until there's some additional information that we need. Um, so can I just list, I'm not expecting this information just now, but I think we need to know um, <coughs> the value of projects being funded by the Public Works Loans Board. I think we need a breakdown by year of investment of the seven point, well, if you include five college, 7.3 billion. Uh, I think it would be useful to get some trends and comparisons comparing year on year and also um, total spend as a percentage of GDP with other countries. I think it would be useful to get a profile of the revenue spend to support the capital spend. Uh, and I think it would be useful if we could also, and it might, this might need to come from another source, UK government capital spend in Scotland. Uh, not that I expect it to be much. Uh, the local authority capital spend or any other public sector capital spend not included in these figures. And I th most importantly, I think um, where it's available, the leverage, in particular the, private, the leverage of private sector investment and EU investment, I think would be helpful as well. Um, and that's just a request for additional information. And it's on Terry's list, Terry's copy of the list of projects, and I'm sure he'll follow up to make sure that all that's uh, followed up okay. And I think with that information, it gives us a better all round picture in terms of strategy as opposed to individual projects. Can, I've got, sorry, Eleanor, did you? It, may I just say something before you? Yeah, I. I um... I'm not sure I quite got all of that down, but I will um, follow up. It'll be, it'll be in the report, uh, I'm yes, sure. exactly. I'll follow up afterwards yeah, yeah. to make sure we got all the points. Great. Just a few things um, to say. I mean, you, you noted yourself that we wouldn't, necess we wouldn't ho hold the information on UK government investment. We also, for obvious reasons, won't hold the information on local government investment beyond that which we are involved in. Um, we would have to, I, th I think we would have to reflect on what's the best way of getting that information in front of the committee. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm thinking, for example, of capital spend and housing. Now, I presume in here, well, I know in here, will be the Scottish government's element of the capital investment, but typically for social housing, that's about a third of the total cost. And uh, housing associations and councils usually borrow the rest. So that would come under leverage. Uh, but some of it will be, some of it will also be direct investment from balances by housing associations or from the housing revenue account by councils. So, in other words, what I'm saying is this isn't the, anything like the total picture uh, for public sector investment in Scotland. And I think it'd be useful to get a rounded figure, especially housing, because that's such a huge figure. Um. I absolutely recognise um, the need to understand in the round public sector investment. There's there's a couple of points in that. Um, as I say, we've, we would have some work to do to figure out how we get all of that information in a sensible format. We'll go. We'll take that away and see what can be done. There's something about leverage, though, and what we regard as leverage, and whether. Scottish government putting in investment to release local government investment is leverage or whether it's Scottish government investment to release private sector investment. I think Peter was going to say something about leverage. I mean, these, I understand the point that you're making about overall levels of investment. T to me, there, there is the ability for, to deliver additionality of investment through, for example, through the MPD and hub DBFM projects where there is private sector investments in our infrastructure that is paid back, as we know, over time through public budgets. So that gives additionality of, of investment at present. There's also areas, as you've suggested, where there is leverage of public sector investment, bringing in other forms of investment that the government doesn't eventually have to pay for. And, and housing is a good example of that, where the rents from occupiers um, eventually repays that debt or um, the additionality of investment there, that leverage. Another example of that is in tax incremental financing and the growth accelerator, where, for example, across those schemes, there's been overall around about £100 million worth of public sector investment has gone into those schemes, 
which has drawn in, and you see this, for example, in Edinburgh St. James, and catalyzed around about a billion pounds worth of private sector investment in the property in the area. That, and I, I would call that a very clear example of leverage, where our public investment has catalyzed and leveraged in that private sector investment. So there's a whole range, a spectrum of different sorts of that, and it, it's quite hard for us to think where the line might fall as to what it's useful to report in this particular format and, and in this setting. Um, because drawing the lines between those different classes of investments is, is quite a difficult thing to do. So we'll have to give some thought on how to, how to do that. Just to get a total picture, can I ask a very specific question about housing investment? Uh, I mean, about a third of the three billion over five years commitment on housing, about a third of that is through programmes like shared equity uh, programmes, uh, help to buy programmes. Um, it is, for example, the Scottish government's uh, funding of shared equity with the shared equity that the Scottish government puts in uh, to a house be counted as part of a, the capital spend of the government or is it counted as revenue spend? So the help to buy scheme in, in Scotland has been funded through um, this very particular kind of um, of uh, allocation that we'd receive from Treasury, which they call financial transactions, which is money that the, that the government... Um, can invest but has to go out with government, but, um, general government, so out with central or local government. Um, and it's in the form of loans and, and that have to be repaid. So help to buy is funded from that tranche of funding rather than a more general revenue funding. And, and again, financial transactions, given the importance of financial transactions, I think it'd be useful if we got a regular, as part of this extended report, you, a, a, an overall picture of financial transactions, because obviously we've had a number of layers of financial transactions. And I think, you know, that that's investment. It's still investment. It's funded a different way, but it's still investment. Uh, I think that would be helpful. But specifically on shared equity, outside the help to buy scheme, which is funded through financial transactions, the shared equity investment, is that counted as capital spend? The financial transact treasury score are the financial transactions as capital spend. And they count it within the Scottish Government capital budget. We obviously try to keep it as slightly separate. It is still capital, but we recognise it's a separate stream because we can only use it in certain ways. But, but there is shared equity that's not funded through financial transactions, which uh, pre well predates financial transactions. So is that spend... I mean, if, if the Scottish Government puts 40 grand shared equity into a new house, is that counted as a capital investment? Um, the... Before we got financial transactions, the shared equity schemes that you're referring to were funded by capital, traditional capital. However, because we now have financial transactions, we're able to fund the non-help to buy shared equity schemes using financial transactions. So any future schemes, um, and current time future schemes on shared equity are funded from tra financial transactions Actions. rather than capital. Okay. So it's and, those are, and sorry, the open market shared equity scheme is part of the affordable housing programme. So that over three billion figure includes an element of financial transactions for the open market shared equity schemes, right. which are classed as affordable housing. Okay, because when you add all of this additional stuff up, it's well over eight billion, you know, the, the total capital spend, isn't it? On, on housing? Well, housing is three billion. Um, a, and um, some of that will obviously, a lot of that will be included in the Dale, right enough, but the financial transactions won't be included in Dale. It is. Is it? Yes. So, th so that the financial transactions are already in there. So could we get a breakdown of the Dale figure between financial transactions, which is money that needs to be repaid to the UK Treasury, and what is... I mean, I mean with Dale, presumably, there are three, at least three elements. One is straightforward capital spend, in traditional method, where there's a capital budget, we spend it, number one. Number two, there is a capital spend funded through our borrowing powers, through the uh, Public Works Loans Board. And number three, there's financial transactions. There may be other bits and pieces, but those would be three subheadings of the capital deal then, is that right? I think on, on the capital deal, um, we wouldn't distinguish between what programmes are funded from the block grant for capital deal and, and borrowing powers because it's all scored in treasury terms 
is capital Dale. So it would really be two. We'd have capital Dale and financial transactions um, are, the are the two subcategories for scoring purposes. But, but it's important from the point of view is if because if it's funded either through if it's funded through borrowing then it hits the 5%. It's a contributor to the 5% limit of repayment, whereas if it's funded from the capital grant element, it's not. So to get a total picture of investment, it'd be useful to have that breakdown. So you can have, uh, of course, at an aggregate level, we have that. In yep. fact, we show it in the draft budget document every year, it'll be reflected in the accounts. So we've got all those numbers and they're in the public domain. Um, the... I think what Helen's talking about is funding of a given individual project. So we don't, we don't decide that that project is funded from borrowing and that project is funded sure. from the capital uh, grant. It's, uh, it's a pool of money. Yeah, yeah. The, um, so, and we separate out financial transactions also in the budget documentation and the accounts for you to see. Um, so I, that, that information is in the public domain already. It's easy for us to... to um, it's just that, you. you know, we're identifying... That in this, we're ad it's a kind of... We're identifying the sources of the funding, which are NPD or pre before that PFI, or it could be other, but we don't identify financial transactions as a source of funding. Uh, it's all subdued, it's sub subsumed into the capital <laughs> deal. And I think it'd be useful if we saw that information um, and be clear about what's coming in and what's going out. And, and where the stuff that's coming in, the money that's coming in, how is it coming in? And how does it go back out again? I think is the important thing. Okay. Happy to do that. I can. I could just pick up one other point. There's been reference to Public Works Loan Board, that funds local authority borrowing, where Scottish government borrows it through technically through the National Loans Fund, which is or or we have obviously the power uh, now under the 2016 Act and the fiscal framework to borrow from other sources, should we so wish. Yeah. Okay. But that would be helpful. That would be very helpful. I'm not. Asking for that this morning, obviously. <laughs> hey, can I? I don't think reading them out would be very helpful to the committee. No. Can I ask just a couple of other questions? First of all, the use of framework contracts. I have to say, when I was cabinet secretary for infrastructure, I was not convinced um, about framework contracts uh, in terms of their economic impact in Scotland. And when I look at the number of large procurement projects that are going to businesses out with Scotland and the same is true at local authority level um, I, I wonder um, if we didn't have these large framework contracts um, if we would have greater economic benefit if we had a, a different system has and I'm not asking you to answer that yes or no what I'm asking you is has there been any independent assessment evaluation of the different methods of procurement, not in terms of just obtaining value for money in the narrow accountancy sense, but in terms of the economic and social benefits um, to the Scottish economy um, it, with the different methods, because I am not convinced that framework contracts maximise economic and social benefit. I know that, I mean, you're quite right, this, this is not my area of expertise, but I know that my colleagues in procurement have done an awful lot of work on that particular point and have, um, ha you, you will be very aware of the European procurement rules, the, the framework within which we operate, and the fact that we cannot, um, we, we have to have an open uh, competition for public procurement, but there has been a lot of work done around um, social benefit, and trying to make sure that there are better opportunities for uh, small and medium SMEs to be involved in all government contracts. And I'm aware that while I know frameworks can be problematic and sometimes um, there is at least a perception that that means that only larger companies wind up on the framework, um, there are obviously issues about subcontracting and supply chains and how uh, smaller companies can be brought through. And if you run individual procurements for every individual thing, that doesn't automatically benefit every small company either because there's a vast amount of paperwork associated with actually competing in a, in a procurement. But I, those are some general points. My, my colleagues who deal with procurement in the round would have more to say about it. Peter, is there anything you wanted to add from uh, the experience? I would say there's frameworks and frameworks. 
Um, there's, a, there's a time and a place for lots of different sorts of procurement across Scotland for different scales of projects and um, different programmes of work. When we do projects at a programme level, as you see through the Hub programme, for example, which isn't a framework, but it, it's a long-term arrangement, then that has the brings us the ability across a whole range of different projects to, to take a view of the economic impact and what's going on across what would be smaller projects that wouldn't be reported, for example, at this level in, the, in their own right. And we can tell you from the hub programme, where we do take that programme level view, that of the prime value, so the actual construction cost of the projects done in that programme that have been completed or reported on to date, over 78% of the value of that work has gone to Scottish SMEs. So the, that will be principally through subcontracts because in the construction industry, as you know, there's lots of layers of companies doing, doing the work. 78% by value, yeah. And that's over a billion pounds of the work has gone to Scottish SMEs through that programme of activity. There are some framework agreements that have been procured more at a UK national level, which um, Scottish public authorities have access to. And there's been some procurement guidance um, that authorities should be careful of using some of those frameworks and think really carefully about what's right for any individual project. Because as you say, when there's a, a very broad procurement done that covers, that gives authorities the ability to, to select for a, for a framework partner that hasn't got a, 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 a local interest in the original procurement, then there can be, there can be difficulties with the, the, um, whether that reflects the local circumstances and whether it reflects the best practice that we want to see in Scotland, for example, on engaging SMEs on um, the training and, and apprenticeships that come through these, these contracts and the form, of, the form of contracts we want to use. So there's a time and a place for everything. I think we do need to be careful about the large nationally uk nationally um, procured framework arrangements but it is possible to bring the benefits to smaller authorities who perhaps don't have the skills and capacity to run as as eleanor has said a whole series of individual procurements we, we can do that at some scale and still bring the benefits of local engagement in the supply chain so, so there's a time and a place for everything but we do need to be careful i agree if we're coming out of the single market, because these rules are part of the single market rules, basically, a lot of the procurement rules, um, it does present an opportunity for us to have a fundamental look at procurement rules post-Brexit post uh, and an opportunity maybe to um, improve the economic and social benefits from from procurement. And I think I think this is an area that no doubt the Auditor General and certainly this committee should be should be looking at in, in more depth, convener. My final point is, and this is really to Peter, um, I think I, irrespective of whether you agree or disagree in relation to uh, hub financing uh, and whether that's an improvement on what's gone before and so on, and there are people on both sides of that particular fence I think a frustration that's shared by both sides is sometimes the lack of sufficient transparency um, with the hubs and their operations. Uh, is the Scottish Futures Trust going to look at, and the Scottish Government, improving the transparency uh, of hub activity? And I speak as somebody who's, you know, I've, I've traditionally been a supporter of uh, hub projects because they've produced a lot of good projects in Scotland. Uh, I think there's an issue around whether there's a better way to do it now with all the additional powers we've got, but that's a separate matter. But I think in the short term, the transparency issue is one that the uh, apparent lack of trans sufficient transparency causes problems for policymakers and uh, uh, people in the economic sphere and academia and in this parliament in terms of trying to get the information needed to decide how va how good value for money we're, how much value for money we're getting from hub projects certainly aware of the interest in in hubs and as i said yeah. before that's one of the effects of delivering projects through a large um, program arrangement as hub is and we report through a quarterly updated project dashboard 
across the hub program on over 200 individual projects, their value, their program, um, and the, the dates associated with them, those projects have an average value of around about 12 million pounds, which wouldn't fall um, under the 20 million pound limit that this committee tends to look at if they were done as individual projects. But because they're done as part of that program arrangement, we get the additional transparency um, of those projects to this committee. We report at a program level on the, the jobs and the community benefits, and I've already talked about the SME engagement for the, the projects because we feel that it's most helpful across a program to look at those elements at a program level. So the, the, the values and timescales we report at a project level and the, the community benefits, again, we publish quarterly on our dashboard at a, at a program level. As for some of the individual contracts in the hub program, people have been particularly interested in design, build, finance and maintain contracts. The vast majority of that contract documentation is, according to the standard form that, that Scottish Futures Trust wrote, is uh, available from the time of contract award. It's not commercially sensitive information, so it can be released immediately. There are elements of the, of the contract documentation, um, in particular some of the financing costs, which are deemed to be commercially sensitive for a period which is much shorter than the period it was under previous arrangements, and that's the completion of construction plus an additional two years. Um, that's a, a standard term in our standard contract documentation. And the, we've thought really carefully about the balance of the public interest and the commercial confidentiality in releasing that information. And it's been the subject of an Information Commissioner decision during this year, which upheld that that was a reasonable period to maintain that particular element of confidentiality. But, but we, we've been in discussion about releasing some averages on the, the cost of capital, which has been of particular interest to people. And across the hub and MPD programs, the average cost of senior debt is 4.09%. And the average all-in weighted cost of capital is 4.74%, so just under 4 and 3 quarter percent for the overall cost of capital. So we're able to, to, to talk about averages but for that reasonably short period of time, we don't talk about the, the, the specifics because it is commercially confidential to those parties. So we feel that there's quite a good level of transparency. I know there's been some discussion about hub companies themselves replying to freedom of information requests. They're not covered by the, the FOI legislation. Um, all of the public authorities that they work for, and indeed SFT, are covered by FOI legislation. And we've been very happy to answer questions sent to us in relation to the hub programme, as I'm sure public authorities are. The, the hub companies have a duty to cooperate with any um, request made by a participant to help the participant answer an FOI question. And we're not aware of any hub company ever failing to cooperate with a public authority who are, who are bound by, by FOI in answering a question. So across the programme overall, we feel there's a good level of transparency, but if there are individual points that people want to raise with us, we're, we're, we're very happy to respond to those. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just ask you one question before we move on, um, and it's round about the 5% borrowing rule, because my understanding that only applies to the Scottish Government. It doesn't apply to health boards or local authorities, indeed, who may be, well, particularly local authorities, who may themselves be borrowing to build major capital projects, is that correct? We, we're talking about the the um, rule the Scottish Government has chosen for itself, that yes. it will keep its, it, the cost of borrowing below 5%. Um, well, where health boards are being core funded from Scottish Government, then I think they're within scope. Helen yes. could pick that up. Yes, health boards themselves can't borrow, but if there were any projects funded through NPD, PFI, um, or for health, those two, two routes, they would be factored into the 5%, but local authorities are not. OK, so we, we don't therefore know the overall level of public sector indebtedness. It was the point that Alex Neil made. Um, surely the whole of Scotland accounts um, that are due soon, I hope, um, will actually be able to tell us this? Um, we, either Peter or I could say something about this, that local okay. local authorities obviously have their own caps on borrowing and um, 
they will report on, on the position in their own account. So you're right, we don't have it yet in one single place, but that will come. Can board point of view that the, 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 the unity charge payments for the, the PFI and the, the hub and MPD schemes that the um, we that information is reported within their own annual accounts um, and you'll find that the, there is a, a, a range um, across boards as to how, how many schemes they have of that nature so places like Lothian and Lanarkshire they have uh, some uh, big PFIs, whereas uh, some of the smaller boards will be pretty minimal. So that information is certainly reported through their annual accounts, um, but within the overall kind of Scottish Government, five percent that, that that would feed into that figure. I suppose what I'm looking for is a figure that tells me over time the overall level of public indebtedness, um, because basically we we and well it will be our children that have to repay the debts we incur now. It would be very useful to know what that total figure is. When are we likely to see that? I'm, I'm afraid I don't think I have a, um, a time scale immediately, but we'll follow up with you. I understand it's of interest, and we'll follow up as soon as we can to let you know when that would be. Okay. No, none of us know for sure. We will okay, I think the government committed to do the preparatory work in this financial year coming um, and whole of government accounts or whole of public sector accounts coming next year. Is that yeah, right? They, they are, uh, yes, that is right. I'm sure they're coming. I just um, I couldn't answer your specific okay. point about timing. Okay, I think the sooner the better would be the message from, yeah. from this committee. Um, okay, can I move on to Willie Kofi? Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, I wonder if I could maybe come back to one of the issues that Alec Neal was raising, but hopefully ask a few simpler questions because I didn't quite follow the explanations there. Um, the paper we have in front of us explains that our capital budget is about three billion a year, but it also says that under the, the Scotland Act, the terms of the Scotland Act, the Scottish government can borrow only up to four hundred and fifty million pounds a year, and it also says that we haven't actually used that money uh, to fund any capital investment other than to support some of our major projects. My question to you is, where does that £450 million restriction come from? Is it some kind of financial guideline on it, or is it a political decision? Is there scope to review it or change it that would ultimately allow us to enhance the capital programme? So it's, it's a restriction from HM Treasury. It comes from the fiscal framework that was agreed between the Scottish Government and the UK Government um, following on from Scotland Act 2016. Uh, we wouldn't have scope to change it unilaterally. It would need to be um, a, d a negotiation between the, the governments. I mean, is there any discussion about whether it's the right value or could some kind of flexibility? Is there any commitment to review it over the coming years? Or, the, or there is a commitment to review the, fiscal, the whole fiscal framework in, I think it's 2021. I will double-check that, but I, I think it was five years on. Uh, and I'm sure... Um, we would we would want to review um, borrowing limits and, and all other aspects at that point. Um, you will appreciate there was um, significant negotiation to reach the fiscal framework level that we're at at the moment, and so um, I, I think we're unlikely to be able to seek significant changes ahead of the review point. Okay. I'm asking this to, to, to explore any ways where we can enhance the capital programme and deliver more economic impact for, for Scotland. So I'm, I'm interested in the routes that might lead us in that direction. And one of them must surely be the Scottish National Investment Bank that's mentioned in the paper also. So it was just to get a, a feel about where we are with that and how that went, what the timescales for that will look like and how that will impact on the, the capital programme. So, uh, again, as you know, um, the First Minister made an announcement in programme for government this year, in September uh, of this year, and um, the, there's a, a, a programme of work being led by Benny Higgins of um, Tesco Bank, who uh, is due to report in February of next year with an implementation plan for the National Investment Bank. Um, I would expect that to be an implementation plan at pace because we would want to get the full benefit um, of, an, of having a national investment bank as quickly as possible. Um, but I think the detail will emerge in February when we see the outcome of that implementation work. And can you share any details at all at the moment? Will there be an element of borrowing in there to, to, to provide resource for that from a variety of sources? Or how, where's its funding going to come from? 
but the expectation would be that the Scottish Government would put in some money to capitalise the bank and then it would leverage in um, other money to, to be able to provide a programme of investment. But the detail of what that would look like can't come until we have seen the report of the, um, of the, um, the implementation plan from Benny Higgins. Do you wish to add anything, Peter? You're involved. I think, I think it's just worth saying that a bank will only ever provide financing um, which has to be repaid over time. So, uh, and we know that there are various means of doing that, whether it be the government's borrowing powers, whether it be um, the MPD, DBFM programmes, or potentially in the future, the, the National Investment Bank. But all of, the, all of that sort of finance has to be repaid eventually from generally two sources, either from general government budgets in the future, from revenue budgets in the future, or from user charges of the people that use the infrastructure that, that, that is financed. So if you're looking at the bank, for example, potentially being a, a player in financing energy infrastructure, then energy infrastructure is paid for by energy consumers through their user charges for gas and electricity and so on and so forth. So the, that, that would be a, an ability to raise finance that isn't eventually paid for by government budgets. But if the bank, for example, was to finance a new road or, or a hospital, then that's fundamentally a government asset that would have to be repaid at some point in time from, from government budgets. So the, 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 there are some options as to which areas the bank plays in. But if you're thinking about whether it can deliver a great deal of additionality and the ability to capital invest in the schools, roads and hospitals, that, that we all want to see built, then that is at least as much constrained by our ability to repay that in the future. And we've talked about the 5% cap and other, me and, and other constraints like that, as it is the ability to raise finance to start with. So is there any connection between that initiative, though, and the, and the restrictive 450 million borrowing limit for capital that we have? So there's bound to be a, surely there's a connection between the two. And if, if, if one was increased or, or reviewed or enhanced, it would increase the powers of the SNIB to invest in, in the economy. The, the, the cap would cover um, borrowing by Scottish Government or by entities that are owned and controlled by Scottish Government that are publicly classified. Um, so if the Scottish National Investment Bank, in, in the form that is recommended in the end in February, falls to be classified to the public sector, then its capitalisation would fall within that, that borrowing powers limit and with financial transactions and other sorts of budgets, it would, have to, it would have to be within that. If a bank is classified to the private sector, then it, it, it has its own borrowing powers, but in that case, it cannot be controlled by, by the government. So a, a publicly controlled Scottish National Investment Bank would be constrained by the same caps as, uh, as we've discussed, yeah. Okay. Eleanor, what are you going to add? <laughs> as I'm doing. All right, okay, thanks. I wonder if I could ask about a particular project in the report to convene or the digital superfast programme. It, it, I think it's going particularly well. We've got about 780,000 premises covered, 95% coverage by the end of this month. But I wanted to just focus a little bit of attention on the R100, which is the commitment to 100%, and it's the only government in the UK that's got that commitment. This is going to be the hardest, but the last 5% is always the hardest to do. But there's not a lot of details in the report to tell us anything about you know, schedule, we, well, we know the schedule is 2021, but there's not a lot of detail in there. And this is potentially quite an expensive part of the procurement because it's the most difficult to reach areas of Scotland. So can you give us any other information about, about that, where we are with it and how we're getting on? We're expecting the procurement for that to start um, by the end of this month. Yes. yes. Um, and uh, it, it, other information about it may, um, may emerge in the Scottish Government's draft budget publication on 14th of December. I don't think there's, um, there's anything more I can tell you at this stage, unfortunately. As, I mean, as you know, convener, uh, members are always interested in when things are going to be done, and it's particularly difficult to pin down sometimes when these programmes are going to roll into your particular area, and it'll be the same with this, but 
at any point in this, between now and 2021, will we be able to see the rollout by location and where the, the, the you know the installations are going to take place, or you know how is it going, how is it going to work? So I, I would, um, I think you would have to, the the procurement would have to be concluded. I think to have a full plan before you you would actually understand in what order anyone would be would be tackling as you say that 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 last five percent that that last part is very is the hardest part. Um, part of the procurement process would be teasing out who's got the best offer in terms of doing that at best value to public purse. Um, and so the full plan would only emerge once the procurement process is concluded, I would expect. Yeah, but um, forgive me if I'm going on, but constituents, and I'm sure I'll share this with my other colleagues here, are always asking us, what year of the four years ahead am I likely to be done? Which I think is a perfectly reasonable question to ask. Will we at any stage be able to answer that, do you think, for constituents? If they say, what, am I in 2017, 18, 19, 20 or 21, will we be able to tell constituents when they will be? So done? that once, once procurement is concluded, once the contract is let, there will be a plan. I, um, I imagine that it would be possible at that stage to, to say something about the order in which actions would be taken over the four years. Um, you say that would be again when the uh, I don't know how I don't know exactly when the project the the uh, procurement will conclude it, it won't be a straightforward procurement if it's starting in December it will take some you know it will take some time so I don't I don't wouldn't expect that until until well through next year yes, I, think it, I think it's probably about a year for the procurement process to uh -huh. take place so by say this time next year we'll know the whole implementation and rollout plan and schedule and by location and so on? Uh, oh. I, I don't know that. I don't know that that is the case. I, <laughs> oh, I think I'm saying that you, we wouldn't, I wouldn't expect to know it before that. Yeah. Um, I would assume that we would know it sometime soon after that. I can ask my colleague who deals with broadband to give me some more information about that for the committee, if that would be I helpful. I realise I'm pressing you for information you probably don't have, but I'm this, is so. <laughs> this is information that constituents want. And I think they're entitled to, to have it and to, to be given that information as soon as we possibly can. We absolutely understand the point mm. and we'll take that back. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Convener. OK, Thanks. can I just go back to borrowing for a minute? Because um, my recollection is you used borrowing to fund the gap in projects caused by ESA 10, which, of course, as you will understand, is the reclassification of projects. That also caused you to change the profile of, of HUB projects for the future so that there is um, less um, public sector involvement and therefore potentially more private sector involvement. Um, I wonder whether you could just remind us of what the costs of borrowing were as a result of ESA 10 changes. Yes, I do. Um, so for the NPD projects that we had to use um, our borrowing powers, we agreed with the HM Treasury that it would be notional borrowing because we didn't actually have to borrow money, but, but we had to score it against our, our borrowing powers. And in 2015-16, it was 283 million and 333 million in 17-18. So that was and quite a substantial that's, that's, amount. So that's, the, that's the notional borrowing. Yeah. And um, there will also be an impact in 17-18, but it's not not part of the notional borrowing, it's part of it's patched into our capital budgets. Are you in a position to tell us how much that um, is likely to be? I can... Sorry, it's, it was um, 234 million. OK, and that's simply the legacy of the four projects that were reclassified because of ESA 10? Yes. OK, so 234 million, um, which I'm assuming counts against our 450 million a year limit it does okay so could I just clarify that the notional borrowing the 333 million that I said that that was what went against notional borrowing but that was our limit in terms of borrowing in 2016-17 but the the what we had to score for the NPD projects was actually 398 million so the, there was a an additional element over and above the borrowing figure okay so if it was 398 million where did the balance of 65 million come so from that, was that that was factored into our Dale programme, but again, it, it's budget. It was, it was budget cover that was provided, not not 
cash requirement, but it was factored into the capital budget in 1617. But, but budget cover requirement would have meant that that money couldn't be used elsewhere. Yes. Is that a fair comment? Okay. Yes. So it could be described as an opportunity lost? Yes, I think that's, that's fair. Okay. Okay. Now, let me focus, and I, I appreciate you can't say anything about this budget coming. I just want to ask a more general point, because you've got, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds in pipeline projects coming forward. Is your expectation that the Scottish Government will use its borrowing powers to fund some of those projects? I think ministers have made clear that they would they would want to maximise investment. So we'll see the position in the draft budget, but it, my expectation is there will be use of borrowing in future years, yes. OK, so any borrowing that's on legacy projects because of ESA 10, again, is an opportunity lost for this coming year to invest. So some of the pipeline projects won't proceed um, in the time that you anticipated. In this coming year, I don't... Helen, is no. there any notional borrowing in this coming year? There's no notional... Borrowing. 234 million. Yes. Yeah. In 1718, but not in 1819 in the future years. Sorry. So. Next year is a future year. We haven't reached that financial yeah, year yeah. yet. So <laughs> that's the future for yeah. me. So, you know, we're already borrowing in actual cash, not even notional cash, 234 million. Um, that means the 450 million uh, level is reduced by that amount already. So I'm again looking at opportunity costs for the pipeline of projects that are there. Are you going to have to reprofile any projects? Um, we don't have to reprofile any because that was factored in for the 1718 okay. budget at the time. So there was no 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 projects were stopped to make way for that. that. It was all factored into the requirements at the time of setting the draft budget last year. Okay. I accept no projects were stopped because some have been delayed. The start dates, their outline business case pushed back because we saw that with hub projects at the time of ESA 10. I mean, I could list um, a whole number of them that, that were delayed because of this. So it's likely that that could have happened in this case. Comment on the hub ones, Peter. Well, yeah, I, I mean, the convener is aware that some of the um, DBFM projects that had to be put on hold whilst we reconfigured the structure of the hub program to allow those to go ahead under the new rules. So those projects have now all, all gone ahead. Um, I think you're making reference to other capital projects outside of the program, and, and that would be. Yes, absolutely. Um, we, we set that we have a, as you know, we have an infrastructure investment plan. We have the pipeline. The, the detail of timing isn't, we, we don't have a program with the detail of timing absolutely nailed down across multiple years. So we are flexing in order to um, accommodate uh, the, the, the very unfortunate um, classification change that came through. Um, but we've, we, we've got the pipeline still and projects are going ahead. I don't call it a delay, but I call it flexing. That would be okay. Um, if you wish, yes. Hmm, interesting. Okay, um, Bill Bowman. Is reprofiling the same as juggling, just to understand? So you have, you have a programme of work, you have budgets available, we make the, we make the projects fit within um, the, bu the budget available over the piece. Uh, we're make, trying to make sure always that we're making the very best use of the public money available. I was going to ask about the Scottish National Investment Bank, um, just to build on what Willie Coffey had already asked. Um, you, Eleanor Emerson, had said that effectively this bank could produce funds that you could spend and spend. Peter Rickey said, no, hang on, it's all within the same um, limitations. So does the Scottish National Investment Bank make any difference to government capital spending? I, I described that under different potential formulations, different rules would apply to it, but the the work hasn't yet been done to work out to, to the recommendations haven't been made by the group to say exactly what form the National Investment Bank will take. So I, I, I was trying to describe options. I can't tell you what form the National Investment Bank will take because those recommendations haven't come forward just yet. So you will have more money to spend or you won't have more money to spend? We... We will be feeding into the work that's being done on the National Investment Bank. The aim is, obviously, 
to get maximum value out of the bank. There are choices about whether it sits as a public body or whether it sits as a private body and what nature of public body. There may have to be discussion with Treasury about how it does or doesn't fit within existing Treasury rules if it were to be a public body. So I can't answer the question until we get to a position where we understand what the nature of the body is to be. Well, well the other thing Peter Ricci said, of course, was that um, at the end of the day, it could be the poor consumer again that, that pays for these projects. Is that likely to be the case with government projects as well? I was trying to describe a situation where a, a, a finance, financing is the process of, of raising money to initially pay for something and the funding of it is how it's paid for over time. Elements of our infrastructure are funded from government budgets, from general taxation, roads, hospitals, schools. Elements of our infrastructure, um, generally communications infrastructure, energy infrastructure, are paid for by user charges. I wasn't trying to suggest any change in that mix. I was simply suggesting that when you raise finance, it's repaid from a different route depending on what you're raising finance for so okay if we don't know it sounds like it's another bank rather than something different if um if i mean we do not have a scottish national investment bank at the moment so it would be a it would be something different we are waiting for recommendations about what exactly its focus should be um there are many choices that you could make about what kind of body it should be, what its main focus of investment should be, um, that will all come in February and we will follow up from there. But it will be something different. Sorry. No. I think the potential choice here, though, and it, it's, it's a trade-off, is if it's a private institution, then obviously the borrowing limits don't apply, but potentially the interest rates could be higher. Is that correct, as an assumption? I, I think that might be, um, I, I don't think it, uh, it would automatically follow that if it's a private body, the interest rates would be higher. I think it is more a, uh, a question about how you would like the bank, how the bank is to be, to fit within the landscape, um, how it is to be accountable both to ministers and indeed to this parliament, um, how far it's a, a private body, how far it's a public body. Um, Yes, there are considerations about how it fits within the rules that we operate with Treasury. And there may have to be some discussion about what kind of body we want it to be and how it would fit with those rules. Okay. And presumably, it'll be to some extent using the experience and modelled upon similar kinds of banks in Germany and Scandinavia and so on, because obviously they have been highly successful. Uh, indeed, we would want to be following all of that um, mm. that, that experience. The, some of the things I'm describing are the particular complications of, set, of devolution rather than um, uh, being setting up a bank when you are um, doing that at an independent state level. Screwed by Treasury rules. Uh, <laughs> your, your wording there you <laughs> Okay. Bill Bowman, do you have any further questions? Uh, the other aspect would be the opportunity cost, I guess, of how much this bank's going to cost to, to run. Do we have any indication of that? Uh, not at this stage, because that obviously is, again, down to choices of what it's going to choose to do. And, and I wonder whether I could pursue further some value for money issues. And at the risk of losing people in this, I want to talk to you about senior debt and subordinate debt. Um, senior debt interest rates have been reported um, at, I think you said 4.09%, Peter Ricci. Okay, I'm glad I was listening. Um, that's when the underlying LIBOR rate is 0.5%. Now, in the past, um, the senior debt interest rates have been between 6.8% to 8.3%, but the LIBOR rate was over 5%, 10 times higher. Do you think that 4.09% is value for money? given the interest rates are so low currently? The, that's an interest um, a rate that spans over the deals that have been closed across the programme to date, and the LIBOR rates have moved around, as you would expect, over that period. So there's always going to be a difference between the underlying risk-free interest rate and the rate that a project finance lender 
will give you for an, for an individual project at a point in time. And we believe that 4.09%, which is broadly akin to the, the pooled rate of, of PWLB borrowing that local authorities use that's been measured over a very um, different period of time, um, and it's below the rate of government borrowing for a similar period, 20-year gilts, for the, the 10 years previous to the, to the programme. So overall, that provides a, a good cost of finance for doing infrastructure investment at, at this point in time. And yeah, represents value for money. You don't think it could be any lower? We've not been able to get any lower rates, although we always try to get the best deals possible. Okay. Um, can I ask you about subordinate debt rates? Because uh, my understanding is that they average 10 to 11 percent. Okay. Um, so I would be keen to know, you gave us a, an all-in borrowing cost, which is very welcome. Uh, I think that's the first time we've had that figure of 4.9 percent. But how much <coughs> does subordinate debt um, in percentage terms rate to that overall borrowing cost? So the figure I gave for all, all in weighted cost of capital is 4.74%. And the average cost of junior debt, you're right, is in, in between 10 and 11%, around about 10.8% overall on average across um, the hub and MPD programmes. OK. I, I, let me come back. I was asking, it, did your 4.7% include, as an all-in borrowing cost, the cost of subordinate debt? Yes. So okay. we have senior debt... Average at four point zero nine percent. Yeah. Junior debt average at ten point eight percent, which leads to an all-in weighted cost of capital at four point seven four. Okay, I got that. What I'm asking you is, what percentage of subordinate debt is there in that total debt figure you've given me? Well, it's around about the gearing across all of the projects is round about ninety percent of senior debt and ten percent of junior debt. Okay, so 10% of junior debt makes up that total figure, yet it's gone up by about one percentage point when you average it. So what, what's happening is 10% of the debt is accounting for a 25% increase in your average total cost. Is that right? I don't quite follow that mathematics, but the, 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 the senior debt rate is 4.09, so 4.1%, let's say, and when you average it overall, it's four and three quarter percent, four point seven five percent. So there's a point six five percent difference between the, the, the senior debt rate and the all in cost, uh, and and that's the impact of around about the ten percent of of junior debt. Okay. I suppose what what I'm debt. driving at is the cost of debt, subordinate debt, is greater, and that's yes. demonstrated by your all in borrowing cost because the amount of subordinate debt. Um, not the interest rate, but the amount of subordinate debt yeah. of that total cake is 10%, yeah. yet it's factored in quite a substantial increase to the overall percentage of, of borrowing. Yes. Okay. So these are, these are highly so, geared projects, and around about 90% of the debt that we have in the projects is the cheaper and lower risk form of senior debt. And to improve the value for money overall, that there is a, always an attempt to minimise the amount of risk capital or junior debt, subordinated debt in there, which is the, the more expensive, higher risk form of debt, which I've said is, is average across the programme at around 10.8%. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me ask something further. We, we have evidence emerging that some people who own subordinate debt, if I can describe it in those terms, are selling that debt on in secondary markets because there is an excessive margin of profit to be made, they're able to do this. And what we have is the bizarre situation where somebody might be borrowing and deciding whilst they're making their borrowing repayments that actually the value of their debt should be sold on. So not only are they then selling it on to somebody else, but they're still having to make those borrowing payments alongside it. Um, is that not gaming the system? And are you not concerned about the excessive margins of profit that would invite this to happen? So there is a secondary market in the in the private sector in, in this um, junior, junior debt or the investments in, in projects. What tends to happen is that... Um, primary investors and developers will take 
um, the risk around the construction phase where these projects are at a particularly high risk and indeed the bidding stage where they may or may not win the projects and have to invest sums of money to, um, to become the provider, if you like. Once that construction phase is over, then the, this investment, in many cases, has been sold on to pension funds and other institutional investors who are, are very keen to hold that investment for a long period of time, 25 years, which is the average um, length, because that matches their liabilities over, that, over, the, over the period. So what that allows the primary investors to do who take that construction risk is to recycle their capital and do, and do more projects and invest in, in, in future projects. But yeah, as the, as the risk reduces over time, there are investors who see that risk differently and will effectively pay more for that investment because they will accept a lower interest rate over time now that the risk is reduced, yeah. Okay, so the, the, there is a market there um, that, you know, some, for example, local authorities are generating the debt, okay, because they want to invest in important capital projects in their area. Um, they're then spotting that there is a wizard wheeze to be had in selling that debt on, um, making a profit out of it, but still paying their borrowing charges. Does that make sense in terms of, I mean, I'm turning to Eleanor here, in terms of kind of public sector accounting practice? Are you talking about the public sector selling on shares of, yeah. of subordinated debt? Well, we, we, we hold an element of that debt on behalf of the public sector, and we in SFT, in F, our investment subsidiary SFTI, um, hold that and have absolutely no intention of, of selling any of that. We, we, we're very keen on the role that that investment gives us in the governance of the project companies and and are clear in our annual accounts, which are published every year, of our intention to hold that debt until maturity. So, so reports in um, local council finance agenda papers are entirely speculative and wrong? I, I couldn't tell you about all reports in any local authority okay. council agenda papers. I can. <laughs> okay. 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 Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. I'd like to just focus on a couple of specifics uh, in the report. So, first of all, at page 60 of the report, which is the appendix showing the progress and projects developments, uh, we have two references to prisons, or uh, yeah, prisons, uh, for want of better, which show... On the National Facility for Women Offenders, the total cost of the project has increased by 13.5 million due to additional requirements. Uh, and we then see the Inverness Justice Centre. Uh, the project appears to have required an extra 6.5 million of funding, which surprised me because that's nearly £20 million pounds extra required on two projects. Are you able to give us any detail on what's going on there? So I... I, I can't give you any information about the, um, the women offender facility. I, my understanding on the Inverness Justice Centre is it's not a, um, an, a, a cost overrun of the project, but merely um, looking at what's funded from where amongst partners um, to make sure that the whole thing could be... I think there was an expectation that some partner bodies, all public sector bodies, would, would uh, pool money, and instead we have... Um, we've put the 6.5 million through directly um, to make this project go ahead. So I don't think that's a cost overrun. And my best understanding, I can't tell you about the women offenders facility, I'm afraid. Would you mind providing clarity afterwards? Uh, so on the women offenders facility, it, it, it's 13.5 million of additional requirements that wasn't scoped uh, or appears to have been uh, unscoped at the procurement stage seems like an awful lot to be missed. So I would uh, appreciate some clarity on that. Uh, on the Inverness Justice Centre, just if you wouldn't mind, and I appreciate you may want to write in on this as well, but it, it says quite clearly additional funding of 6.5 million has been received, which of course begs the question, received from whom? From Scottish Government. From the Scottish Government. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, which then leads on to it was presumably not budgeted for by the Scottish Government at the point of procurement. 
um, I think I think it was uh, not at the earlier plan stage, but it was that was reviewed and agreed before they went ahead with procurement, is my understanding. On, on the, I'm, sorry, I'm just going to turn to Helen for more detail of that. Um, I was just going to say that, that would, the additional um, six and a half million would be factored into um, the budget process again. It's, I mean, the, pro the project's not yet complete, so it would be something we would take into consideration when we're setting future budgets for the. Um, so the, 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 perhaps the wording there that it has received, it wouldn't receive it in advance of it needing it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a budgetary issue. It's received confirmation that it will, that, that the budget will increase. I think it's probably better terminology. Right. Thank you. Uh, the second thing I want to look at is the, so on the, the following page of that appendix, uh, page, or the previous page, page 59, the V&A in Dundee, uh, which I see very frequently and it looks fantastic. It appears to have a cost of 45 million. Uh, the first question, which is just a point of clarity for me, it, in Annex A, at page 21, and Annex A being, as I understand it, how projects are being funded. Uh, page 21 appears to suggest that the cost of the project is about 80 million. Uh, I'm clearly misreading something, but could you help me why the discrepancy, please? So the 45 million um, was the initial cost at the Outline Business case. Um, the, the way that these reports um, work is that we are now providing the OBC information um, and then the latest information as of September compared to what we provided in February but previous iterations of the report would have indicated that that cost of 45 million had actually increased and the overall cost of the project is 80 million which is recorded in the project pipeline. Um, the whole 80 million is not Scottish Government funded though it's a council-led project. Yes that that's actually my next question so okay so the cost of the V&A is, is now, give or take, 80 million. Uh, when it was 45 million, I had understood that 25 million was coming from government, which suggests 20 million is coming from Dundee City Council. It, it, now that it's 80 million, is that still the same split? Is it still, is it roughly 40 million from government, 40 million from Dundee, or how's that broken down? Um, I would need to come back to you with the precise breakdown, um, but the further element from Scottish Government um, is a part of that is coming through the um, Dundee Growth Accelerator project, so um, which is um, a mechanism where when, when outcomes are met, funding will flow to um, to the council. But I will need to confirm the precise amount um, that's coming through that mechanism. I'd be grateful. Thank you. Uh, when it's built, so I, I see the timeline uh, is for about June 2018 for opening. Uh, if, if I'm wrong on that, please do correct me. But once it opens in 2018, my understanding from the report is that it, effectively the that's the building. The operation of it is then handed over to Dundee Design Limited, which going forward will run the V&A, will, will provide the product. Uh, so I'm just curious, how long is that contract with Design Dundee? Is that self-funding, or w is there some kind of contribution from the public purse? Or indeed, does Design Dundee kick back to the public purse? Uh, and of course, what happens if Design Dundee don't fulfil that contract? I think we'd have to come back um, on the specifics of that. My understanding is that Design Dundee is a, um, an arm's length organisation affiliated to Dundee City Council, but we'll come back and clarify. OK, thank you. OK, um, I've just got a couple of other little bits and pieces. Um, can I start with the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route? It's a, a question I asked when we were in private session at the Economy Committee. Um, let me ask it again because I don't think I've had an answer. Um, the cost to complete assessment was reported in the newspapers as being delayed. That, of course, is the process that looks at um, time to complete and cost overruns and is essential to keeping on top of um, a project. Um, my understanding it was meant to take place in October, but didn't do so. Has it taken place now? 
No, I, not to the best of my knowledge. Okay. Um, my understanding is the, these things are absolutely essential um, in capital projects, particularly big ones like the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. Um, there was some suggestion it was delayed because of um, the difficulties experienced by Galliford Tri and Carillion, where they both reported significant losses and the fall in their share price. And the suggestion was this was delayed to help them. Is there any truth to that? I'm sorry, I can't... Um Okay. I, I, I'm not aware that there's any truth to that. The key thing for us is that the, the road is still uh, scheduled to open for traffic um, in winter 2017-18, and obviously we'll be staying on top of the, the financial aspects Okay, we, well. we, we share your um, desire to have the road complete and, and functioning well and on time. Um, you can understand the concern if some of the two... Two of the three major contractors um, are reporting these kind of difficulties. We want the contract to finish. Um, I asked that in private session previously. I've now asked it on the record. I would be grateful if somebody would write to me with that information. Thank you. And one final thing. Um, Alex Neal certainly has read most of the report we commissioned from the Cuthberts, but he missed one thing. So aside from the Scottish supply chain, which he, he covered... I'm curious to know that in terms of Tier 1 and Tier 3 contractors, are they covered by the Scottish Government's procurement guidance? The Tier 1 and Tier 3? Yeah. So the hub companies are not specifically covered by the Scottish Government's procurement guidance because that's about procurement by public authorities. However, there they are covered by the terms of the original um, procurement that selected them as partners and they select supply chain members um, to deliver for the local economy as much as they can. And as I've said previously, 78% um, of the prime costs of those projects are delivered by, by Scottish SME companies and we report um, on our dashboard on the amount of training and and jobs and, and other important community benefits that come out of the hub programme. Okay, so you, what, what you're saying, and I don't want to put words into your mouth, but what you're saying to me is the Scottish Government have excluded hub from their own procurement guidance. Well, the, the, the hubs were procured by the um, participants at the outset of that programme, and the guidance that was in place at the time of that procurement was used in procuring those hub companies. OK, let, let, let me get down to brass tacks here, because the government, I think, and I, I, I wait to be contradicted, but the government and parliament care about things like the use of blacklisting companies, the payment of the living wage, all of these things. Are you telling me that you don't monitor that amongst Tier 1 and Tier 3 contractors? Do we have any idea whether they're paying the living wage or indeed you know, um, whether they are, are engaged in blacklisting, all of that? I couldn't tell you through all of the subcontract chains of all of those entities um, about the, the living wage, for example. Okay, so none of that is monitored? There is monitoring at, a, at the level of the key performance indicators of the hub companies which are, are published every year. The key performance indicators contain a range of information on community benefits, on achievement of um, programme and financial targets. Those key performance indicators which are public are the things that we that we monitor across the hub programme. OK, that's a very helpful way of telling me what you don't monitor. So, you know, I won't find reference to whether a company is blacklisting um, or has in the past. I won't find reference to payment of the living wage. The, the reason I'm pursuing this is that the substantial sums of public money, I think both the government and parliament have made their intentions clear about what they want, but this doesn't seem to be happening in practice. Is that a fair comment? Well, we can look into... The, the comments you made, um, but I've already said what, what we do look at, which was um, a, a range of key performance indicators across all of those projects and programmes. OK, thank you very much. Any further questions from any other members? No? On that basis, can I thank our witnesses for attending this morning um, and for subjecting yourself to, to some quite grilling questioning on behalf of my colleagues, um, and we now move into private session. <laughs>